So this is our um, lecture unit for metabolism, and we're working on PowerPoint B. We had just started it. And in PowerPoint B, you guys are going to be looking at some specific metabolic pathways, glycolysis, aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration. Um, we'll be looking at photosynthesis, two types, and then we'll also be looking at um, the nitrogen cycle. So that's where we're going over the next two lectures. So folks, last time we had um, described um, what conditions were like on primitive Earth when the first cells that evolved had to find a way to make ATP. And we are saying that um, when the first cells evolved, there was no molecular oxygen present. The atmosphere was anaerobic. Um, cytochromes, electron transport chains, hadn't been invented yet, so cells couldn't carry out respiration. So we were exploring and had just started describing this very primitive way to make a little bit of ATP for glucose. And this process is called glycolysis, li literally sugar splitting. And spe the specific glycolytic pathway we're looking at is called the emden meyerhof pathway, but we'll just use the term glycolysis. So we want to, um, in, in micro, you guys, for our lecture exam too, you just need to know really basics, like what's going in, what's coming out, what does a cell accomplish? So unlike maybe some of your other classes, maybe like an A&P, you had to learn the intermediates and all the enzyme names. We aren't going to do that. So pretty much, you guys, with glycolysis, what I put up on the board here, if you understand this, this very superficial cartoon, you have what you need to know for the lecture exam, OK? So you guys, this is um, on the PowerPoint. This is slide five. Um, this is official glycolysis. And what we can see on your PowerPoint slide five is we're going to start with glucose and six carbon um, sugar. We're going to sacrifice two ATP to phosphorylate the glucose and its intermediate to destabilize the glucose to get it ready to be split in two. And then folks will see that this is the actual glycolysis um, part where the six carbon sugar will be split into two three carbon intermediates. And um, I think it's a really nice description. Often folks will break back the glycolysis into um, two different stages. Stage one is energy investment, where we're actually spending ATP. And then stage two is the payoff phase, where the cell is going to make per glucose one, two, three, four ATPs. Right? And since you guys, the cell spends two ATP to get the whole thing started, what's the profit? What's the gain of ATP per glucose in glycolysis? Two, right? So the cell will gain two ATP per glucose. And we'll see for those primitive cells that was enough. Um, we'll see it's a very wasteful process, right? But let's just look at, at just what we need to know for lecture exam two for glycolysis. Okay? So you guys, so glycolysis, it's the partial oxidation of glucose, meaning we're only going to strip off a few of the high energy electrons. We're only going to rip off like four high energy electrons. Um, and, and again, we're going to make a little bit of ATP. And what we're first going to do, you guys, is take a look at what's going to happen to the, um, the carbon skeleton. We like to keep track of um, the carbons that used to belong to glucose. We want to keep track of where, where do they go, where do they end up. Okay. So folks, since I'm not going to, we don't need to know the enzyme names nor the intermediates, I'm just going to use a series of arrows to indicate the 10 enzyme-catalyzed steps. So for glycolysis, there's 10 different steps, so we need how many different enzymes? 10. So each of these arrows you guys just represents an enzyme-catalyzed reaction. I'm not sure if I have 10 there or not, so it's just kind of a, a symbol. So one thing we want to know, folks, is our six-carbon glucose, we're going to break it in two, right? So one of the end products will be two three-carbon um, end products, and those are called... You can call them either pyruvic acid or pyruvates. Pyruvate is just the ionized form of pyruvic acid. And again, you guys, we just we're trying to keep track of the carbons that used to be part of glucose. Okay, so that's an important end product is the two pyruvic acid or pyruvate. Um, but then, in addition, you guys, we want to see what else is going into this process. So we could just do. You know, here's things coming in, here's important products coming out. So folks, remember we had to sacrifice what to get this process started? Two ATP, right? So initially the cell has to spend two ATP. And the reason for this, oh god, I brought my, I, pop, I brought my pop beads of science. Okay, 
So, okay, so glucose um, is really stable, right? It's strong covalent bonds, so it's not gonna it's not gonna split in two, right? Without some energy being invested. So we could argue that one reason that the cell sacrifices 2 ATP is a 2 ATP. We're gonna transfer phosphates, um, one phosphate from each ATP to our glucose intermediate. So we're gonna phosphorylate the glucose intermediate. And folks, if the, um, the pH of cells, the phosphate groups are gonna be charged. So what kind of a charge do they have? Negative charges, right? And what do we know about, about like charges? They, they repel, right? So can you imagine that's putting a strain on the carbon skeleton already, those, those charged phosphates repelling one another, right? So we could describe it as the phosphorylation, adding those phosphate groups, is going to help destabilize the glucose in preparation for what? Being split in two. Okay. So again, the cell has to sacrifice those ATPs to get the whole process started. Okay. Now, once, once we, we um, start rolling here, another cool event in the energy um, payoff stage is we are, as we said, you guys, we're going to start ripping off some high-energy electrons. So we can't throw the high-energy electrons into the cytoplasm, right? We always have to have a receptor there. So who's going to be our electron hydrogen atom acceptor? NAD. Good. Okay. So we're going to do two, right? So we're going to end up stripping off a total of four high-energy electrons from what used to be glucose. So we're going to end up with our reduced NADH. Okay, and again, they're, they're carrying high energy electrons that used to be part of glucose, right? And then, folks, it's like, well, where's the ATP, right? So this happens towards the very end of glycolysis. Now, um, the cell will make a total of four ATP, so I'm going to have four ATP coming out here. But to make this balance, you guys, I need to make sure I have the components of four ATP over on this side. I already have the components of two ATP here. But then I need to add an additional two ADP and two phosphate. So this is just our symbol, you guys, for inorganic phosphate, one of those phosphate functional groups. So this will come in. And as we mentioned, you guys, we're eventually going to end up with how many ATP made? Four. Good. But you guys, how many did we spend? Two. Yeah, we spent two. So I'll subtract two. So what's the net gain? What's the profit of ATP? Yeah, so we, we'll say profit of ATP is 2 ATP per glucose. Now, you guys, that's a really low ATP yield, right? But initially for the little, you know, the little primitive cells, it was sufficient, and there was a lot of preformed organic molecules around for them. So they didn't have to be that conservative, right? They, they could be wasteful. Now, the reason, you guys, I'm saying that this is wasteful is you get, if I use a little asterisk as a high energy electron, right? Our glucose is chock full of them, right? So I'm just going to put these kind of random numbers, right? And remember, you guys, in glycolysis, we're going to rip off four of those high energy electrons. So this NADH, it carries actually four, the, the two NADH is a total are carrying four high energy electrons. So did we rip off all of the high energy electrons from glucose? No, this is a partial oxidation, right? So that means what? Do these pyruvic acids still have lots of high energy electrons? Yeah, that's why we're saying it's kind of wasteful, right? You're not harvesting all the high energy electrons, but we'll see later how the cell will do that later on. Okay, all right, folks. So. That's glycolysis in a nutshell. Okay, so you guys, what happens to the glucose carbon skeleton? Where does it end up? The two pyruvic acid, does that make sense? Okay, and we're going to rip off some high energy electrons from what used to be glucose. Where do they end up? There, okay, right. Are we going to make some ATP? Yeah, a total of? A, oh, say, I know it gets confusing. A total, what are the total number of ATP made for, right? What's the profit? Two. Two. Awesome, you guys. And what did the cell have to spend to get glycolysis started? Two. Two ATP. Good job, you guys. Now, I don't want you to fret about this too much, but this ATP is made 
in a process called substrate level phosphorylation. And we've got a, a slide, you guys, to show what we're talking about. And we can kind of keep this on the back burner because when we, we finally get to aerobic respiration and we talk about this massive amount of ATP that's going to be made, we're going to see the cell uses a second way to make ATP. So we're just introducing this description so that at the end of aerobic respiration, we can compare these two different ways of making ATP. Okay, good, you guys. All right. So let's see what our slides have for us here. Okay, so again, you guys, this is just in words, glycolysis. So our six-carbon glucose is split into two three-carbon pyruvates. It's partial oxidation of glucose. The electrons are transferred to our NAD to make reduced NADH. A total of four ATP are made through substrate-level phosphorylation. And um, so since the cell spent two ATP, the net gain will be, the net profit will be two ATP. So that's glycolysis in a nutshell. And this, folks, is just an example of substrate-level phosphorylation. In this specific example, um, again, our whole focus, you guys, is ATP synthesis, right? So in this example of substrate-level phosphorylation, which occurs in glycolysis, we'll have an enzyme that will bind an intermediate that's carrying a phosphate group. And when the enzyme catalyzes, is transferred this phosphate group from this intermediate to ADP to make what? ATP. Okay, and again, you guys, right now this might be kind of like, well, so, but when we get to aerobic respiration, we'll see there's an entirely different way of making ATP, and then we can contrast it to the substrate level phosphorylation. So, folks, you might say, well, okay, this, this looks all right, but there's a huge problem, you guys, and the huge problem is that cells only have a little bit of this oxidized NAD. There's only a little bit in the cell. So this is in limited amounts, right? So folks, if the cell is carrying out glycolysis, what's happening to all of its oxidized NAD? It's all getting reduced to NADH. So you guys, if glycolysis continues, will the cell use up all of the oxidized NAD? Yeah, it will, right? And what happens, you guys, is that step, right, that step where the NAD is required, um, at that point, glycolysis shuts down. It's like putting a roadblock there. And the important, the important thing to recognize, you guys, where is all the ATP being made? Before the roadblock or after the roadblock? After the roadblock. So what's going to happen to ATP synthesis if the sun runs out, if the sun, if the cell runs out of um, NAD? There'll be no more glycolysis, no more ATP production, and what will happen to the cell? It'll die, right? So there was, you know, natural selection for cells to find strategies of how to um, oxidize this reduced NADH, meaning the cell had to find some molecule to dump the electrons um, onto, right? They can't just throw them into the cytoplasm because the naked electrons are really harmful. So, folks, the, one of the earliest strategies was, those first early cells, they took this pyruvic acid, which is just a waste product, right? And so the cells use the pyruvic acid, and the fancy term, you guys, the pyruvic acid will become the final or terminal electron acceptor. So what do we mean by that? So again, folks, the goal is, is to dump the electrons from NADH. Where are they going to dump them? Onto pyruvate. Okay. So let's see what happens when we do that. So we'll, we'll try to keep it balanced, you guys. Two pyruvic acid. We have our two NADH. The NADH dumps its hydrogen atom, its electrons, onto the pyruvic acid. This is what the cell's after, right? This oxidized NAD. What is this going to be used for? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep glycolysis operating, right? We're going to resupply the cell with the oxidized NAD. Does this make sense, folks? Okay, good. So the only other thing we need to ask ourselves, well, what happens when this pyruvic acid, this pyruvate, is reduced, right? It's accepting electrons, accepting hydrogen. Um, 
hydrogen atoms. So our pyruvic acid, folks, is going to get reduced to lactic acid. Lactic acid? So what we've described here, folks, let me, let me keep going on the slides, okay? Let me just refer to the slide, you guys, because this has the actual chemical structures. So, folks, here's our pyruvic acid, the end product of glycolysis. And here, folks, we, we see this step where the NADH is going to donate its electrons, hydrogen atoms, to py pyruvic acid to make what? Lactic acid, okay? All right. So this process, folks, is called lactic acid fermentation. And this is a way for the cells, if, if we talk about lactic acid fermentation, folks, beginning with glucose and then going all the way to lactic acid, we could say lactic acid fermentation is a way for cells to make a little bit of, of ATP, 2 ATP for glucose, under anaerobic conditions when they don't have um, an electron transport chain to use, right? And part of fermentation, you guys, is the final or terminal electron acceptor is an internal organic molecule. Internal meaning the cell is making the um, terminal electron acceptor, right? So let's take a look, folks, at um, Pasteur's definition. So Louis Pasteur was the one that came up with the description of fermentation, and he described it as life in the absence of air. Why did he say fermentation is life in the absence of air? It's an anaerobic process, right? No molecular oxygen is needed. So this is perfect, right, for the early Earth when there was no molecular oxygen present. Okay. You guys, are we ripping off all the high-energy electrons from glucose? No, nope, right? That lactic acid still carries what? Lots of high-energy electrons. So it's a partial oxidation, right? A partial oxidation of glucose. Our... Final or terminal electron acceptor, you guys, again, it's an internal, means the cell makes it itself inside the cell, organic molecule. In this case, it's pyruvate. Again, it's anaerobic. It doesn't require an electron transport chain. Um, and again, you guys, if I asked you what's the gain in ATP from lactic acid fermentation, if we begin with glucose, what would be the gain of ATP? Two ATP per glucose, good. And again, you guys, ATP is made by substrate-level phosphorylation. The end products, you guys, this lactic acid, is it still high energy, meaning is it still carrying lots of high energy electrons? Yes, right? So is this wasteful? It is wasteful, right? This is still waste product. We're throwing away all these high energy electrons. And folks, the other thing we want to remember is in these fermentation processes, many of them produce acids. And um, some of them will see produce alcohols. Now, if you have a community of cells and they're carrying out fermentation, that means they're producing lots of acids and alcohols. Could that potentially harm you? Yeah, how? What do we know? What do acids and alcohols do to proteins? Denature them, right? So we could argue the end products of fermentation, the acids and alcohols, are also you know, kind of harmful for cells. Okay. All right, so that's a big overview, you guys. But now what I'd like to do, we will, we will come back to alcoholic fermentation. But you guys, I want to work up some, um, I guess we could call them applications of lactic acid fermentation because we could have a whole course just on fermentation, you guys. It's really fascinating. The uses of fermentation is amazing. But let's just talk about a few. So, folks, often uh, fermentation pathways, and there's many, many fermentation pathways, they're often named after one of the end products. So, thus, we know in lactic acid fermentation, what's one of the end products? Lactic acid, right? Okay, good. So, oh, lactic acid fermentation is so cool. So, folks, lactic acid fermentation, human cells still remember how to do this. Remember, carry out. Lactic acid fermentation. When would your cells carry out lactic acid fermentation? If your cells don't have enough molecular oxygen to carry out aerobic respiration, can they switch to lactic acid fermentation for a short period of time to make a little bit of ATP? Yeah, yeah. So those of you that, you know, if you're runners or you're working out really hard, Sometimes your muscles will use up all the oxygen, so your muscles become anaerobic, right? So what do your muscle cells switch to? 
lactic acid fermentation. Yeah? And some of your colleagues in previous classes that have been into exercise physiology, um, they've shared that maybe, you know, like when you start working out really hard or have a really hard workout, the next day you're, you're a little bit achy. And it might be, you know, you're stretching muscles. But some of that achiness might be from the lactic acid accumulation in the muscles. And I believe, and you guys in A&P, correct me if I'm wrong, the lactic acid will be transported to the liver where it can be converted back to glucose. Is that right, you guys in A&P? Thanks. Thanks, Vicki. Good. All right. And, and also, folks, um, to me this is fascinating. Remember when we talked about endotoxic shock, sepsis, septic shock, mm -hmm. and we said there's a decrease of blood flow to the tissues, to the cells, so they're not getting enough oxygen? So what can your cells do in this desperate, you know, desperate attempt to make enough ATP? They'll switch to lactic acid fermentation. And I think, folks, this is why um, when a patient is being screened to see if they are going into sepsis or septic shock, they'll, they'll check the blood acid levels, right? And if the acid level is unusually high, that might be a suggestion that the cells aren't getting enough oxygen and they're switching over to lactic acid fermentation. Yeah, so it's, it's still, it's kind of our, our, our emergency backup, right, under anaerobic condition. It, we can't survive long, obviously, you guys, we know we're, you know, we'll suffocate rapidly, but the cells can maybe make a, enough ATP just to give us, I don't know, I don't know if it would be like a few more minutes of life, right? And then, folks, um, again, looking at humans, we have all kinds of wonderful, beneficial bacteria called lactic acid bacteria that live on our mucous mem membranes. Why do you think these bacteria are called lactic acid bacteria? Because what do they carry out? Yeah, they carry out lactic acid fermentation. And um, these lactic acid bacteria, you guys, it's a great big family. It includes members of the genus Streptococcus and uh, Lactobacillus. There's others, but these are just a couple of pretty common ones. And folks, these lactic acid bacteria, they are part of our normal defenses. We forget that. These good beneficial lactic acid bacteria, they live on our mucous membranes. They take sugars our body produces. Um, ferment them and make lactic acids and drop the pH, right? Drop the pH. And as a consequence, you guys, that low pH, that, that acid will inhibit the growth of many um, opportunistic pathogens. So we could put you guys, and I'm trying to, because of the movie here, I'm trying to kind of scrunch it in here. So we could say, you guys, these guys are, um, um, they're beneficial <coughs> members of the human microbiome, the acids they produce inhibit opportunistic pathogens like good old candida albicans that we, um, in lab, we saw today or we will see today. So candida, I'll just put candida as an example of an opportunistic pathogen that will be inhibited. It can't grow to really high levels when you've got lots of your good lactic acid bacteria. And folks, we talked about this in lab this morning, and we'll talk about it again in the, um, the one o'clock lab. So you guys, what happens when you give your patients broad spectrum antibiotics? What happens to your, your good lactic acid bacteria? Yeah, wipes them out, right? And now, do the candida have any competitors, any inhibitors? Yeah. Will the candida be killed by the antibiotics? No. no why not? They're, they're fungi, right? They're not going to be killed. So when you wipe out all your good lactic acid bacteria, now the candida have no competitors. There's no inhibition. So they replicate to really high numbers. And then we end up with so-called yeast infections, right? Right. So again, folks, those good lactic acid bacteria, they're part of our normal defenses against opportunistic pathogens. Good. Good job, guys. All right. And then furthermore, you, furthermore, and I'm so sorry, I listen to my lectures and I say, do I say you guys like a mama? I'm so sorry, that's so obnoxious, I'm going to try to break myself. So another really interesting thing about lactic acid bacteria is they can be used to preserve foods in the absence of refrigeration. And two examples that we'll use, you guys, are dairy products or milk products. So um, 
If I say dairy products, you guys are talking about milk. And the other one is vegetables. So our ancestors, for generations, there was no refrigeration around. Yeah, and so our ancestors learned just by, maybe by, I guess um, serendipity would be the word. They, they kind of stumbled upon this, that if you can have lactic acid bacteria ferment your milk, the acid inhibits spoilage bacteria. And so you can preserve the nutrients of the milk in the absence of refrigeration. So folks, can you think of some fermented milk products? Yogurt, perfect, what else? Buttermilk, cheese, kefir, have you guys had kefir? Oh, love it, okay. And it's, it's really interesting guys, because if you take, if we were to take the pH of fresh milk, right? It's around, we'll say around pH seven. Now we're going to add our lactic acid bacteria, and we'll let them carry out lactic acid fermentation of the lactose, right? And they can make so much acid, you guys, they'll drop the pH to pH 4. And each pH unit, you guys, it's a, it's a log scale. So the bacteria can drop the pH from pH 7 to pH 4. That's a 1,000-fold increase in hydrogen ions. And this is why when we taste the fermented milk, the yogurt, the buttermilk, the kefir, it tastes, how does it taste to us? Sour, right? That's how we detect high hydrogen ion concentrations. We detect it as being sour, and that's why fermented milk tastes sour, right? But again, you guys, the advantage is most spoilage microbes can't grow at that really low pH. So in the absence of refrigeration, you can preserve the nutrient um, value of the fermented milk, right? Um, oh, I know you guys. What? Uh, just so we remember, you guys. If hydrogen ion concentration increases, what happens to the pH? It, it decreases. Good. Okay. And again, that low pH will help inhibit a lot of spoilage microbes. Um, you know, I just said you'd add your lactic acid bacteria, but but folks like on dairy animals and different cultures have different an dairy animals. So like. Um, cows or goats or sheep or horses or camels, right? The mammary gland, the udder, the mammary gland, it's colonized with lactic acid bacteria. So back in the day when we were hand milking, well, how would the milk get inoculated with the lactic acid bacteria? You know, it was on our hands, it was on the mammary gland, right? So it was just the normal flora, you know, of the mammary gland or, you know, on our hands that the milk would get inoculated. And if you hold it at room temperature, the little bacteria multiply and carry out lactic acid fermentation. The same thing is true, you guys, with vegetables. And a kind of a classic fermented vegetables is cabbage, right? So um, in, say, if you're in Germany and you chopped up your cabbage, right, and let it ferment, you would make sour cabbage, sauerkraut, sauerkraut, right? Because it's sour, right? And um, let's say maybe you're making um, kimchi, right, with a variety of vegetables, right? The lactic acid bacteria that are on, on the cabbage themselves, right, they're already there. Yeah, you, you pack them into a jar, you make a nice anaerobic environment, the lactic acid bacteria take over, and they ferment, drop the pH, and that will prevent the spoilage microbes from growing, right? So the lactic acid bacteria are awesome, right? So again, we want to remember that they preserve the foods in the absence of refrigeration by making uh, those acids to inhibit the spoilage microbes, okay? I think those are kind of neat applications. And then folks, we want to just back up here really quickly. There's one more fermentation pathway I would like you to know for the lecture exam too, and that's alcoholic fermentation. And as we can see on our, our slide, and let me give you the slide number for those of you watching the movie. This is slide nine, okay? We can see that the alcoholic fermentation, it's a little bit more complicated. So you guys, alcoholic fermentation, we're coming this way. So we see in alcoholic fermentation that the, um, the yeast, for example, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, who can carry out alcoholic fermentation, right? We refer to Saccharomyces as brewers or bakers yeast. 
baker's yeast because we add it to our flour to make leavened bread. So let's see why does the Saccharomyces cause our bread dough to rise. Okay. It's because, folks, and sorry, this audio, remember this. It's because during alcoholic fermentation, the microbes are going to decarboxylate, remove a carbon, and release it as what? CO2 carbon dioxide. And is that a gas? Yeah. So it's the carbon dioxide that your Saccharomyces are releasing is they're breaking down the, um, what used to be glucose in the flour. They're releasing the CO2, and that's causing your bread dough to rise, right? And then, folks, it's this two-carbon intermediate. And you don't have to remember the name of the two-carbon intermediate, folks. It's called acetaldehyde. This is the internal organic terminal electron acceptor, right? And it's the acid aldehyde that's going to receive the electrons of hydrogen atoms from our NADH. Right? Remember, this is what the cell is after, the oxidized NAD. And when we reduce the acid aldehyde, what do we get? Ethanol, right? A two-carbon alcohol. So folks, and I know we've gone over this before, but why is it that if you eat, if you eat baked bread, you don't get drunk? What happens during the baking process? Yeah, the alcohol, right, is going to evaporate, right? If you ate raw bread dough, I mean, there's going to be alcohol there, but that's usually not very pleasant. It's not like cookie dough, right? Raw cookie dough. But in contrast, you guys, if you were doing alcoholic fermentation, say, on grape juice or on fermented grains, right, and you're, you're not heating it, um, what do you get in the fermented beverage? You will have that ethanol, right? And that's where the ethanol in beer and wine comes from, right, is the alcoholic fermentation. A, a side note, you guys, and to me, again, history is fascinating. Remember how we said Pasteur came up with the definition of fermentation, life in the absence of air? And this was a reflection of his experiments trying to save the French wine industry, right? So the French winemakers were in a panic because all of their wine was turning out sour, what does sour make you think of? Acids, right? So nobody knew what was happening. So, so Pasteur ran a series of experiments with grape juice. And what he discovered was the grape juice was turning sour because there were, there were acid-producing bacteria that were getting into the grape juice. Instead of the Saccharomyces, these acid-producing bacteria were fermenting the grape juice into acids, right? So Pasteur was brilliant. He came up with a simple solution. He, he told the grape, the, the grape growers, the winemakers, when you have your grape juice, heat it. Heat it first to do what? Kill any of the contaminating bacteria, right? And then after you heat it and you kill all the bacteria, now you're going to add what? Saccharomyces, yeah? And that's how he saved the French wine industry. That was, that was kind of a big deal back then. So you guys, what do we call the process um, when we heat liquids or foods to kill harmful microbes, what do we call that process? Pasteurization, right? So that was developed by Louis Pasteur. And the other little tidbit, you guys, is he considered the bacterial infection of the grape juice as a disease of wine, right? Like the bacteria were pathogens, you know, of the grape juice, of the wine. So he talked about diseases of wine, and this helped him when he um, continued doing experiments trying to prove the germ theory of disease, that a microbe can infect another organism and cause harm. Back in the day, some people thought that, that microbial pathogens just arose spontaneously inside of you because maybe you'd angered God, you know, you're a bad or sinful person. So Pasteur and Koch did really important work to prove the germ theory of disease. And I just thought it was fascinating that saving the French wine industry played a part in the germ theory of disease. Okay, you guys. Um, oh, one more thing. Um, we've talked about how the lactic acid fermentation can mm -hmm. inhibit spoilage microbes. Folks, do you think that alcoholic fermentation could help preserve the nutritive value of, um, of uh, germinated grains and fruit juices like grape juice? Do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. Because what do we know about alcohol? What does alcohol do to proteins? It denatures them, right? So again, you guys, we see in alcoholic fermentation, the alcohol is going to help kill or inhibit spoilage microbes. So again, folks, we could argue this was an early way of preserve, preserving foods in the absence of refrigeration, right? You could 
preserve the nutritive value of your germinated grain, um, the nutritive value of your grape juice or other fruit juices by carrying out alcoholic fermentation. And one last little tip you gave is um, it might be this explains why in um, some parts of Europe, children sometimes are introduced to wine or beer. They're served diluted wine or beer. And it might date back to the days in Europe when it was safer to drink wine or beer than it was to do what? Drink the water, right? Because back in the day, people didn't understand fecal oral transmission. You know, feces could contaminate drinking water. And in the feces, you guys, there's all kinds of pathogens, right? And so if you drank the water, you would drink the fecal pathogens. And for little kids and babies, that's devastating. They would develop diarrhea, just die from diarrhea. So it might be just, I don't know, through experiments, you guys, maybe because the adults knew it was safer to drink wine or beer than it was to drink the water. Maybe they, they started adding some wine or beer to the drinking water they gave their kids. And who knows? I don't know. We should do this experiment. Find out if diluted wine or beer will inhibit um, some of the, the um, potential um, bacterial pathogens, right? Yeah, again, you guys, I, history to me is so fascinating because I'm always trying to say, oh, that's related to microbiology, right? That practice came up because of public health microbiology. Okay, let me see here. Are we finished with fermentation? No, not quite yet. And folks, although lactic acid fermentation and alcoholic fermentation are the two pathways I want you to know for our lecture exam, do be aware there's many, many different fermentation pathways. And this, this is uh, slide, what, this is slide 11 and 12, folks. These are just examples of some of the other fermentation pathways. So down at the bottom, it's talking about fermentation um, end products. So we've talked about lactic acid fermentation. We've talked about alcoholic fermentation. There's a propionic acid fermentation. I won't ask these others on the exam. But propionic acid um, fermentation, you guys, is carried out by the bacteria called pro propiony bacterium. And to me, it's fascinating, you guys, because propiony bacterium can contribute to acne, the inflammation we get when they infect our skin. And they're also used to make Swiss cheese. So kind of those unusual flavors in Swiss cheese comes from the propiony bacterium. And I've always thought, what a wild combination, acne and Swiss cheese. <laughs> anyway, go figure. Um, butyric acid fermentation, you guys, by the clostridium. Um, there's a, a species of clostridium called clostridium perfringens, which can cause gas gangrene. If you've seen, like, in the old movies, you guys, somebody has gangrene. Um, so the clostridium can actually ferment our tissues, producing massive amounts of gas. Um, the last two, you guys, the, um, those last two groups... Um, the E. coli and salmonella, they carry out a fermentation pathway called mixed acid fermentation. And in lab, we're going we're gonna to learn a metabolic biochemical test that will let us detect that mixed acid fermentation. It's part of the clues we use to identify an unknown bacteria as a type of fermentation they perform. And then the other little guy on the end, Enterobacter, that's a close cousin of E. coli. It carries out a different fermentation pathway. And so we're going to use a different metabolic test to determine what's called the butylene glycol fermentation pathway. So right now, you guys, we just want to know that in lab we're going to come back and we're going to be detecting some of these different fermentation pathways in our attempt to identify unknown bacteria. And then I love to eat, you guys, so it's like fermentation products. Many of them are good to eat. Some of them are not good. Like don't eat or drink nail polish remover or rubbing alcohol. Don't eat those. These others are pretty yummy. Cheese, right? <laughs> Uh, yogurt, soy sauce, these are all fermentation products, wine and beer. Um, vinegar. Vinegar, you start with a fermented product like apple cider or wine, and then you actually have an oxidation by acetic acid bacteria. But anyway, we'll still say it's a, it involves fermentation. And I was delighted, you guys, because two of my favorite um, foods, oh, again, just all the different fermentation products, you guys. Um, two of my favorite foods or drinks coffee and chocolate. And I was so excited, you guys, because in making coffee and making chocolate, there's fermentation steps involved. And I was like, yes, you know, go fermentation products. <laughs> OK. And this was just to remind me that we are going to be um, learning metabolic biochemical tests in lab to detect these different fermentation pathways. So they're really helpful in identifying unknown 
um, microbes. All right, you guys, so we're going to leave fermentation, and we're going to um, talk about disadvantages of fermentation, why there was natural selection for a more efficient way to make ATP for glucose with less toxic end products, right? So we have to, we have to figure out why, why was fermentation potentially not that great. So we said, you guys, the end products are still chock full of energy, right? They're still chock full of high energy electrons. So it's wasteful. You're throwing away high energy electrons, right? And also, you guys, we said that in the fermentation pathways, the acids and alcohols are toxic, right? They can cause protein denaturation. So this isn't the best way to go. Now, we think that when the first early cells evolved, there were literally oceans of preformed organic molecules. Um, so we could say the early cells, they could afford to be wasteful, right? They had oceans of preformed organic molecules. But once life, you know, had been um, replicating and we're getting higher and higher populations of fermenting cells, they're using up the organic molecules. So would there have been maybe like a food shortage for these little guys? Yeah. And that means there was going to be natural selection for a more efficient way of making ATP and uh, processes that would make more ATP and produce less harmful end products. Okay? So we're kind of setting the stage here, you guys, for the evolution of aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration, that's what we're most familiar with. That's what our cells rely on to make sufficient ATP. Okay? So I think, and this is, I apologize, you guys. I think I am going to rearrange some of these slides. And because what I want to do is tackle this from a evolutionary point of view. So you guys, I'm going to skip from slide 16. We're going to skip up to slide 20, because I want to do this in evolutionary steps. All right. And slide, actually, let me back up here. Uh, let's, let's go to slide 21, you guys, because I want to describe the impact of the evolution of these beautiful porphyrin rings. And we'll do some board work for you guys. So if we're going to switch from fermentation to aerobic respiration, aerobic respiration is so complex. It's got an electron transport chain. It's got... ATP synthase, it requires molecular oxygen. So some big events had to happen, right, before aerobic respiration could evolve. And we're going we're gonna to use the evolution of these beautiful porphyrin rings as the, the trigger, the catalyst, for the evolution of aerobic respiration. And we'll, we'll explore why you guys. So we could maybe um, make the statement that, or may, maybe ask the question, um, what, um, what happened which permitted evolution of aerobic respiration? And I would argue, guys, the big event was the evolution of porphyrin rings. And again, folks, you, you won't have to you know, identify a porphyrin ring. I just wanted you to see what they are. And then let me back up you guys to the previous slide, slide 20, because this will be the text that I'll basically put up on the board. Okay. So the reason the evolution of porphyrin rings was so important is they permitted evolution Uh, and there's, we'll have a, a branch here, you guys. So they permitted evolution of photosynthetic pigments. And we'll come back and name two of them. And they also permitted evolution. When I say permitted evolution, porphyrin rings are part of photosynthetic um, pigments. Uh, porphyrin rings, you guys, are part of cytochromes. And we'll see cytochromes are essential for the evolution of electron transport chains, ETCs. So let's, let's back up, you guys, and do this one at a time. OK, so let's first.
first tackle um, these photosynthetic pigments that evolved um, once the porphyrin rings had evolved. So there's two photosynthetic pigments, you guys. The first one, the earliest one, was called bacteria chlorophyll. And this probably sounds really weird because we don't hardly ever talk about bacteria chlorophyll. Bacteria chlorophyll was the first primitive photosynthetic pigment that evolved, and it permitted this process called anoxygenic photosynthesis. So no oxygen was made, right? And, it, and towards the end of the metabolism lectures, you guys will come back and look at this in a little bit more detail. But once cells evolved the pathway to make bacteria chlorophyll, it just took little minor adjustments and then we had evolution of chlorophyll A. This is the one that we're most familiar with, right? We go CHLA. And you guys, which amazing process does chlorophyll A um, permit in the presence of light? Yes, oxygen. Now, was that a big deal? Wow, was it ever a big deal, folks? Because up until this point, what was Earth's atmosphere like? It was anaerobic, right? And, and thus, with the evolution of chlorophyll A and oxygenic photosynthesis, what slowly started accumulating? What, in oxygenic, what are, are the little cells pumping out? Oxygen, right? So we have this slow accumulation of molecular oxygen. So what happened to Earth's atmosphere? Slowly, slowly, it became aerobic, right? And I think today, you guys, it's, we're at about AMP folks, it's around 20, 21% molecular oxygen today. Does that sound right? About so today we're at about 21% molecular oxygen. Okay, so okay, and, and but it, you could say, well, so what? Who cares, right? Well, now now let's go over here. Let's see how cytochromes permitted evolution of cytochromes. Wait a minute, did I say that wrong? I did. I misspeak all the time, you guys. I'm sorry. Porphyrin rings permitted evolution of cytochromes. Cytochromes are important. Um, components of electron transport chains. And electron transport chains, you guys, permitted evolution of what we call cellular respiration. This is, what, this is where we'll be heading next. And again, you guys, there's two types of um, cellular respiration. Again, you haven't heard of the more primitive type because we only find it in prokaryotes. The first to evolve was called anaerobic respiration because it does not require molecular oxygen. And it makes sense to you guys. Early Earth, there was no oxygen. So when cellular respiration first evolved, it was anaerobic because there was no oxygen around, right? But you guys, what happened once the beautiful little um, photoautotrope started pumping out oxygen, then what evolved? What, what is the type of respiration we're most familiar with? Yeah, aerobic respiration. So I would argue, folks, that this huge change in Earth's atmosphere from anaerobic to aerobic and the evolution of these electron trans transport chains, which we'll see permit massive, massive production of ATP, um, um, permitted evolution of aerobic respiration, this was all because of the evolution of these porphyrin rings. And I'm like, that was phenomenal, right? Just that one, one molecule chemical structure had such an impact on the evolution of life on Earth. Okay, so to me that stuff is just like, oh my gosh, that's like chocolate. Okay, all right, guys. So with that introduction, then we want to we want to now um, um, describe this new way of producing lots of ATP, almost 20 times more ATP per glucose than glycolysis. <coughs> Um, complete oxidation of glucose, um, far less toxic end products, carbon dioxide and water. So we're talking about what? What incredible process that you guys are doing right now? You're not even thinking about it? Aerobic respiration. Good, okay. So you guys, this is the, the, the big overview, the big description of aerobic respiration. So let's walk through it. And this is slide, again, for those watching the movie, this is slide 23, okay? So this is the general description, you guys, of aerobic respiration. Do you see that redox reaction up at the top? Is that the redox reaction 
I'm going to ask you to write on lecture exam two in the short answer. Okay, so guys, let's put it up here just so we'll practice it so you'll get it 100% right. So folks, on the um, lecture exam, the short answer question would, would read something like, um, write a summary reaction for the, write a summary redox reaction for the complete oxidation. What does complete oxidation mean? Are we going to rip off all the high energy electrons from glucose this time? Yeah, we're not going to waste any. Write the redox reaction for the complete oxidation of glucose using aerobic respiration. And again, you guys are going to do reactants. The arrow will represent multiple enzyme catalyzed reactions. So remember, it's just a summary. And then we're going to end up with end products. OK, so you guys, um, if we're talking about aerobic respiration, we need a source of high energy electrons. What's the source of our high energy electrons? Glucose, right? Here's our source of chemical energy, our high energy electrons. That's a reactant. Okay, source of high energy electrons that will be used to do work. And folks, we always have to have a, a terminal final electron acceptor. And in cellular respiration, it's going to be an external inorganic terminal electron acceptor coming from outside the cell, and it's inorganic. So what, what's our second reactant? Our terminal electron acceptor will be oxygen. And notice, you guys, I'm not balancing my equation. So obviously, you don't have to balance your equations on the exam. So this is going to be our external inorganic terminal electron acceptor. OK. So the arrow represents, you know, like two hours of a lecture. So we have to go through all the steps. And so, folks, um, what we want to ask is what's going to happen to glucose when we totally oxidize it? What are we going to end up with? CO2. CO2, good. And, folks, when we use the energy from the high energy electrons and now we have low energy electrons, we have to donate them to somebody. Who are we going to donate them to? Oxygen. So what happens to the oxygen when we reduce it? Water. Good. And what folks usually forget on the short answer section, why is a cell doing this? To release energy. So don't forget energy, folks. As long as you put energy, you'll get, you'll get credit. But just in the back of your mind, remember about a third of it will be used to make ATP. And, and you guys, I'm going to use the old values. These, were, these are just theoretical maximum values. It turns out the cells can't make this much. But I'm going to use the old theoretical maximum. Act. In the old days, it was said 36 to 38 ATP for glucose. They now know it's lower. It's probably like 34. All right, but we'll just use the old values for now. And then what's happening to the other two-thirds of the energy? Released as heat, exactly. So we're still losing a lot, but that's all right. Are we making a lot more glucose, you get? Sugar. Ah, sugar, literally. Are we making a lot more ATP for glucose? Yeah, you could all you could kind of push it, say almost 20 times more ATP per glucose, right? So you're you're oh my gosh, increasing ATP yield, you know, amazingly. And folks, what about end products? Is the carbon dioxide and water are they going to be as toxic as those fermentation end products of acids and alkyl? Yeah, so this was amazing, you guys. This was an amazing amazing event, right, in the evolution of life on Earth. Okay, so you guys, just with that is kind of our our, um, our summary. So you guys, so aerobic respiration, these are description. Complete oxidation of glucose, we're going to rip off all the high energy electrons. Um, we're going to use an electron transport chain, folks, to make a proton gradient, which we'll um, be cartooning and looking at, at um, um, slides. Does it require oxygen? Does it require oxygen? Does it require oxygen? Yeah, look at our reactants, right? We have to have oxygen. So must it occur in an aerobic environment? Yep, you got it. 
And folks, this is the ATP yield. This, this, these are the newer um, ATP yields. On the lecture exam, you guys, it, it would probably be like a multiple choice question. So I make sure that the wrong choices are really wrong. So if, if I ask you, in aerobic respiration, how many ATP can be made? So let's say choice A is two. You know, that's wrong, right? And maybe choice B is 10. You're like, that's not right. Choice C, maybe I put this range, 34 to 38 ATP. And then choice D is going to be 1,000 ATP. So which would be the correct choice? <laughs> See, right? Just I just don't want you to worry. You know, it's like, well, which number are you going to put? I'll try to make I'll try to make the correct answer so obviously correct that you know hopefully you won't have to worry about it. Okay. And folks, um, we're going to see the ATP made during the aerobic respiration. It's going to be used by substrate level phosphorylation. And then this is a new way of making ATP. You guys, it's called oxidative phosphorylation. And we're going to see an oxidative phosphorylation. We have redox reactions of an electron transport chain. That's going to form a proton gradient across the membrane. And then that proton gradient is going to be the energy source to drive massive ATP production by this cool enzyme called ATP synthase. And in videos, we're just doing the big picture now. Don't, don't panic. Our end products are going to be far less toxic right, than the acids and alcohols of fermentation, CO2 and water. And this is another cool thing, you guys. A lot of the intermediates are going to be involved in biosynthesis. Some of the intermediates will be used to make amino acids or nitrogenous bases. So there's kind of like dub doubly good things going on in aerobic respiration. All right. So folks, what I'd like to do, because I think um, this was my experience in learning aerobic respiration. I got so lost in the details, I forgot the big picture. Right? I got so hung up on learning each step, I, I, I really forgot where is this happening and how are the cells benefiting. So what I'd first like to do, you guys, is um, we're going to focus on bacteria first. So what I'd like to do is show you where the stages, the steps of aerobic respiration occur in a bacterium. And then we'll compare it to a eukaryotic cell. So at least we know where this step is happening. Okay. So folks, if, if I draw just uh, a great big bacterium, because that's our primary focus, is looking at aerobic respiration in a bacterium. Okay. Um, the bacterium will transport glucose into the cytoplasm. So you guys, the stages of aerobic respiration, we're going to list them up here on the board. And it's important that you know where each stage occurs. So we're going to say cytoplasm. So what's going to go on in the cytoplasm? So the first stage, glycolysis. The enzymes for glycolysis, you guys, are in the cytoplasm of a bacterium. The second stage, folks, I call it Krebs prep, or some books call it production of acetyl-CoA. These enzymes are also in the cytoplasm of the bacterium. And then the third stage, this the Krebs cycle, it's also known, you guys, as the TCA cycle for tricarboxylic acid cycle. It's also known as the citric acid cycle. On a short answer, you can use any of these terms. All of those enzymes in a bacterium are in the cytoplasm. So this is why I love bacteria, you guys. There's not many compartments. So the first um, three stages of aerobic respiration in bacteria occur where? In a cytoplasm. Good. Okay. Now, oh, this is so cool, you guys. So, what makes um, aerobic respiration? Respiration is a microbiologist. Is a microbiologist when I see respiration, this tells me as a microbiologist there's an ETC involved. Now, this is in contrast, you guys, in anatomy and physiology because you're talking about humans. You know, respiration can be breathing. Um, so be careful, you guys. If you've had ANP, Recognize that in microbiology, respiration means there's an electron transport chain involved. And that has caused confusion in the past. So I just want to give you the heads up here, okay? All right. So you guys, so the cool thing about electron transport chains, ETCs, and I'll use this little cartoon, folks, as my electron transport chain. This will be my cartoon of a five-member, no, is that right? Yeah, a five-member electron transport chain. They must be embedded in a membrane. So you guys, can I have my ETC in the cytoplasm? 
No, right? They have to be in a very specific sequence. So they have to be embedded in a membrane. Which membrane do bacteria have? The cell membrane, right? Yeah? Do um, bacteria have mitochondrial membranes? Nope, right? So you guys, in bacteria, this is really different from human A and P, right? Your ETC in bacteria is where? Yeah, in the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane off the cell wall. And again, folks, this is because the members of the ETC, they have to be in a very specific order. And you guys will just do this randomly. Say one, two, three, four, five. They have to be in that order. Okay. Now, again, you guys, we're just doing this very, um, very generalized, right? So what's happening over here in the cytoplasm is slowly the cell is ripping off electrons from glucose, right? And the cell wants to transport those electrons where? To the electron transport chain, right? And we're going to see you guys, that's the role of our NADH and FADH2, but I'm just going to show these folks as, I'll just show them as just being transported here, oops, to the electron transport chain. And again, this is very superficial, you guys. So what happens, those, those electrons, remember we're thinking of them as little packets of energy. A one, one purpose of the electron transport chain is the um, ETC is going to transport the electrons from one member of the chain to the next. That's electron transport. And the, the reason for this is, is that with each electron transfer, this is going to be our simplified model, you guys, the electrons are going to lose some energy and the cell can harvest some of that energy to pump protons across the membrane. So we can have proton pumping stations here. And as a result, you guys, we're going to end up with a proton gradient across the cell membrane. Now you guys help me out here. Which side of the membrane has the higher hydrogen ion concentration? The cytoplasmic side or outside? Outside, right? So we've got high hydrogen ions outside, right? And we have low hydrogen ions inside. So what kind of transport is this? It's active transport, right? And we know active transport, we have to have a membrane pro uh, protein, right? So that's members of the ETC, they act as proton pumps. But what else do we know about active transport? It requires extra what? Almost, almost you guys, it requires extra, be more broad, general. Extra energy, right? So you guys, this is what always messes with folks on the um, exam. It's because I think we get taught incorrectly in junior high and high school. So you guys, what is the source of energy for the electron transport chain? Is it ATP? What, what is the ETC transporting? Electrons. So, folks, the source of energy for the electron transport chain to pump the protons active transport is what? The electrons. Where did the electrons come from way back when? Glucose, right? So that's what those high energy electrons, that's their big job in aerobic respiration. They're the power supply for the electron transport chain to do what? Uh, is the ETC making ATP? This is where you guys, we are so misled in junior high and high school, it makes me crazy. It's like so many introductory biology books say the ETC makes ATP. Mm -mm. What is the ETC making? A proton gradient. Now you're like, what? You know, what's going on here? But you guys, chemical gradients across a membrane, they're like batteries. They're a source of what we call potential energy. And these are, these are concepts I think they just, they don't even talk about them sometimes in some of the biology classes. So you guys, let's check this out. So the function of the ETC, you guys, is what? What is it doing for the cell? It's forming a, a Gaussian. You nailed it, you guys. It's, its function is to form a proton gradient, a hydrogen ion gradient across the membrane. 
And why is that helpful? The proton gradient acts like a battery. Is, is similar, like, similar to, proton gradient is like a battery. It's a source of potential energy. Potential energy is energy that has the potential, has the, the, the future to do work. And indeed, you guys, these proton gradients are called, are referred to as the proton motive force, suggesting their ability to carry out cellular work, right? And you guys remember cellular work includes anabolism. Is ATP synthesis anabolism, biosynthesis? Are you making something bigger from something littler? Mm -hmm. Right? And also, you guys, in bacteria, proton gradients can be used to drive motility. And in addition, you guys, not to worry, but just, just to kind of drive this point home, proton gradients can be, can be used, and we are going to talk about them, to drive active transport. Anyway, now don't worry about that right now, because we're just focused on what? what? What's the default answer, you guys, in metabolism? If you don't know what the answer is, you say ATP synthesis, right? So what is a cell, in our example, going to use the proton gradient for? Massive ATP production, you guys. Now, who's going to make our ATP? This beautiful, gorgeous enzyme complex called ATP synthase. You've got it. See, there's that ASC ending. What's it doing? What's the function of ATP synthase, folks? To make ATP, you got it. Okay, so, hmm, we've already said that ATP production, we're going to take an ADP plus an inorganic phosphate, and this requires what? An input of energy, right? It takes a lot of energy to make ATP. So you guys, if ATP synthase, if it has active sites, substrate binding sites for ADP, and phosphate, right? And the function of the ATP synthase is to help with the electron rearrangement. So we're going to end up with what? ATP. That requires an input of what? What, what are we missing? Energy. So what's the energy source for ATP synthase? Where, what's our battery? The proton gradient, you got it, you guys. So, in addition to um, having, um, in addition to catalyzing phosphorylation of ADP to ATP, phosphorylation means you guys just adding that inorganic phosphate group. In addition, folks, through the center of ATP synthase, we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna form a water-filled channel. And we want to, okay, we're kind of backing up here, you guys. So, hmm, okay. What is preventing these protons from just diffusing across the lipid bilayer of the cell membrane? They've got a charge, right? So are they going to be able to diffuse through the hydrophobic region of the lipid bilayer? No. They're going to need a membrane protein, right? In this case, filled with water. Could the protons flow back down their gradient from high to low across the membrane through that water-filled channel? Yeah. yeah, it's one of the few ways they can. So you guys, we're going to have movement, we're going to have flow of the protons from outside the cell through ATP synthase, right? That's how they're going to flow down their gradient. And you guys, I do not know the biophysics of this. I know there's some real, really cool YouTube videos where they show this step by step. But I'm going to keep it really simple because I have a simple mind. So as the protons are flowing, you guys, it's almost like an electrical charge. Like instead of electrons with negative charges, we have positive charges flowing through. ATP synthase is a protein, right? And so as the protons are flowing through, it's causing ATP synthase to change shape. And indeed, you guys, it actually spins in space. It's spinning around and around and around, changing shape. And again, you guys, this is so simplistic. So in changing shape, it's assisting with electron rearrangement that catalyzes phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. Okay, very simplified, you guys. But again, without that proton flow, can ATP synthase make ATP? No, right? So you guys, 
let, let me, these are the two questions that people have a hard time with. So let me back up you guys. So in aerobic respiration, what is the source of energy that drives the electron transport chain? The electrons, awesome, you guys. And in aerobic respiration, what's the source of energy that ATP synthase uses to drive ATP synthesis? The, it's the proton gradient, right? Who makes the proton gradient? The electron transport chain, right? Okay. Um, and folks, the electrons, the electrons um, that drive electron transport function, proton pumping, where did they come, come from way back when? Yes. That's it. And you guys, that's the hardest thing is getting that big picture. <coughs> Because what we're going to do now is we're just going to back up and we're going to look at all the details here. But this is the big picture. This is the big deal. This is the really big deal, you guys. This was the incredible evolutionary advancement, was evolution of the electron transport chains that could form proton gradient to drive ATP synthesis by ATP synthase. This is what makes cellular respiration so incredible, right? Are you just amazed? I can tell. You're just like, oh my god, that's just amazing. Anyway, OK. So folks, just really quickly here, just so we can compare. So we're going to focus right on bacteria for most of the rest of the lecture. But you guys, where, let's find out what's going on in your cells. Where does glycolysis occur in one of your cells? In the cytoplasm. Good. Um, and I know this is unfair, but maybe. Maybe this would be for the folks that have had AMP. Where do your cells make acetyl CoA? In the mitochondria. Good. You guys, where um, in our cells are the enzymes for the Krebs prep, also known as TCA cycle, also known as citric acid cycle? The mitochondria. Awesome, you guys. Where in your cells are our electron transport chains? In the mitochondria. And actually, you guys, it's right in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion, you guys, evolved from what? Bacteria, right? So you guys, that inner mitochondrial membrane where our ETCs are located evolved from what? The bacterial cytoplasmic membrane. Isn't that amazing? Okay. okay. And you guys, where is ATP synthase in your cells? In the mitochondrion, in the inner mitochondrial membrane, which evolved from? Primitive bacterial cell membranes. Okay, so just to kind of give that comparison, but where are we going to spend most of our time, you guys? On our prokaryotic bacteria cells. Good, okay. Just comparing you guys cellular respiration to fermentation. These are the steps, you guys, in aerobic respiration. Okay, what's step one or stage one? Glycolysis, stage two, Krebs prep, prep, prep blah, blah, preparation of. Production of acetyl CoA. Step three, Krebs cycle, also known as TCA cycle, citric acid cycle. Step four, formation of proton gradient. Who's going to make the proton gradient? Electron transport chain. What's the energy source? Yeah, the high energy electrons that used to be part of glucose, right? Who delivers the high energy electrons? The electron transport chain. Who's the Uber or Lyft? The electron hydrogen atom Uber or Lyft. NADH and another one, FADH2. Good, good job, you guys. And then um, the final stage, the most exciting stage, is massive ATP production by who's making all the ATP? ATP synthase, right? ATP synthase. And what's ATP synthase energy source? That's it. The proton gradient, the hydrogen ion gradient. Good job, you guys. It's a lot, isn't it? Oh, my God. I had to cartoon this over and 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 over again. Okay. So, you guys, so what we'll do, we have five minutes left. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a humongous bacterial cell. You might want to start on a new piece of paper and maybe do it longitudinal or landscape-wise, right? Because I want to put the key events in all the stages of glycolysis in my little bacterial cartoon. Okay. Okay. So we're all we're doing now is we're just filling in the details. If you get this big picture, you guys, you've got 90%. And if you 
again, folks, we're really superficial here. What's going in? What's coming out? What does a little cell accomplish? That's really what we're asking ourselves at each of those stages. Okay, so here's my big bacterium. And this will be the cell membrane, folks. So this is a bacterium, our model organism. And we probably won't get all the way through this, but we'll just start. So, okay, you guys, so cell membrane, right, of our bacterium. Glucose is transported in. And so what's the first stage, you guys, of, of um, aerobic respiration? Glycolysis. Okay, awesome, you guys. So glucose is coming in. Glucose, the six-carbon glucose, is going to get split into what? Two, three carbon, pyruvate or pyruvic acid, either one is fine, you guys. Good, okay. To get it started, what did the cell have to sacrifice? Good, two ATP going in. During glycolysis, the cell is going to harvest four high energy electrons and pass them to who? Our Uber lift for electrons, hydrogen atoms. So NAD, right? So we're going to end up with what? Two. NADH, okay, and, and you guys, these two NADH, they're carrying four high energy electrons. I'm just gonna use little stars. Four high energy ah, electrons. Where do they come from? From glucose, right? That's, that's what glucose is, it's our source of high energy electrons. Okay, good. Um, are we gonna make any ATP? Gesundheit. Ah, type. We're going to make a total of four ATP, right? But you guys, I, I have to make sure I'm, you know, I have components for two ATP. So to balance this, I have to have the components for two more. So I'll, I'll go two ADP plus two phosphate. Okay, going in, coming out. All right. And again, folks, um, what was the profit of ATP? Two. Right, we spent two. So we're going to have a profit of two ATP for glucose profit. Okay, so we have to hold on to those. You guys are easy to lose. And how did the cell make those? By substrate level phosphorylation, okay? All right, so I'll just leave it as that. All right, now you guys, remember how we said this pyruvate is still chock full of high energy electrons? So the cell now, in the next several enzyme catalyze step, is gonna finish ripping off all those high energy electrons. We're not gonna waste any of them. And folks, in this next step, let me, let me show you the, the, the step that I call the Krebs prep or production of acetyl-CoA. Let me show it one pyruvic acid a, at a time, and then we'll balance it on our cartoon. So you guys, in this next step, the Krebs prep production of um, acetyl-CoA, we're going to decarboxylate our pyruvic acid. We're going to rip off that, that one of the end carbons and release it as what? So now we're starting to lose our carbons as, as CO2, right? And, and then, you guys, what we're going to do is we're going to rip off some more high-energy electrons from this little intermediate, this acetate. We're going to pass them to our electron carrier. Or we could call it the Uber or Lyft for electrons, right? NAD, we're going to make an NADH. And then the final step, you guys, this is kind of weird. We have to have like a carrier molecule for this little two carbon res residue of what used to be glucose, so this little acetyl group. And the carrier molecule is called um, coenzyme A. So the end product, you guys, of this step is acetyl-CoA. And what we're interested in, this is the residue of what used to be glucose. These two carbons and their electrons, this is what used to be glucose. So we get, so folks, if we did, just a cartoon here and keep it balanced. If we go Krebs prep, so we're going to follow the two pyruvic acids. You guys are pyruvate, sorry. So how many carbon dioxide are going to come off? Two, right? Okay. How many um, um, reduced, excuse me, sorry you guys, I misspoke. How many oxidized NAD do we need to oxidize the two pyruvic acid? Two, good. So we're going to we're going to have two of our reduced NADH. Again, you guys, the two NADH are, have, are carrying a total of four high energy electrons. And then the final step, you guys, is we have to introduce that coenzyme A, that carrier molecule, right? 
So where now um, are the carbons and what remains of the electrons from what used to be glucose? They're on this acetyl, acetyl, I can't spell, acetyl CoA, right? And again, you guys, these are carbons and electrons that used to be part of what? Glucose, right? And I, my color coding is all wrong. But you guys, let's stop there. What we'll do, what is today? Today is Tuesday, right? On Thursday, you guys, we'll pick up here, and we're going we're gonna, to uh, finish by looking at how the cell finishes ripping off all the high-energy electrons from what used to be glucose. And then, you know the rest of the story. We're going to ship the electrons to the ETC, form the proton gradient. Proton gradient drives ATP synthesis. So you guys, we got through the hardest part looking at the ETC and ATP synthase. We got through the hardest part. So it's all downhill from here, like in a good way. OK, you guys, so I'll see um, half of you at 1. And the other half, you guys have a good rest of the day. Okay. Thank you.